please welcome Sean Flood. Good morning. I'm uh, Sean Flood. I'm the CEO of the Gotcha Group. Welcome uh, to uh, to the Gotcha Group's East Coast headquarters. So thank you very much for uh, for joining us this morning. Thank you to our Gotcha team for uh, getting out of bed early and uh, and coming. I did I think promise them waffles, which is probably why a lot of them showed up. But <laughs> I, I appreciate it anyway. So uh, so Pioneer is is a big one. And and when I was asked to speak about it, I was like that. I don't know that I fall into that category, but I, I just kind of had to think about uh, what it means. Um, I am constantly reminded by my wife that it does not mean like inventor. Uh, very often she'll be the first to be like, you didn't invent a bike, you know? <laughs> the, those, those of you who know her, like that's like par for the course with her like keeping me insanely grounded. Um, <laughs> But you know, I'm gonna, I guess, kind of Quentin Tarantino this a little bit because you are in our space today and you get to see what the Gotcha Group is and, uh, and probably know kind of what we do. But I'm gonna take you back to, uh, to tell you a little bit about myself and how we got here. Uh, so I went to Florida State, graduated with a degree in marketing and one in entrepreneurship at a time where entrepreneurship was not as kind of cool as it is today. Uh, my parents, in fact, who were both uh, very strong entrepreneurs were like, that can't be a degree. Like that's not a, not a degree anybody gets. So uh, graduated with a marketing degree and an entrepreneurship degree in 2001, went on to work for corporate America and a, as a supply chain guy for years, and then uh, always wanted to own my own business, but didn't exactly know what that was gonna be. I just knew that I had a passion for creating things, um, not inventing things, creating things. And uh, so at that time, this is 2005, in a market where banks are just willing to give a 25-year-old guy <clears throat> a bunch of money. Uh, so, so thank you to those banks who did that. And I decided to start a real estate company uh, focused on adaptive reuse. So buying old houses originally. Uh, turned out that not only did I love it, I loved kind of creating these, these really cool products. Um, I loved the deal. I loved kind of putting, putting property together. Um, but then I started to get into these historic buildings and trying to find a way to kind of breathe new life into them uh, in Atlanta. So had a great run, I'm 25, 26 at the time, making an insane amount of money for somebody at that age. Um, as a result, I was kind of a D-bag. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, that's kind of what happens when you're, when you're 25 years old and somebody gave you a lot of money and your mind is that you're the best thing ever. So I've got, I've got two pretty amazing parents who a lot of people in the room have met. Um, they are very, very like cut and dry, like right or wrong all the time about things that I'm doing. And my dad always used to give me this advice that like, look, you're doing great, but not every business owner or entrepreneur, the first thing they did was like the best thing ever. And you know, he's a dad, so he gives me all kinds of examples. Like, you know, Michael Dell, the first thing he didn't do was a computer and now he's, you know, a billionaire. And I was like, dad, I get it. That's, that's cool advice for some people, but like I broke the mold. Like I've, I figured this out. <laughs> On, on paper, I'm worth a bunch of cash. I'm 25, 26, and I'm like, yeah, I figured it out. Great for those people that it took, you know, Steve Jobs a lot of time to, you know, figure out Apple, but I did it, and I'm, I'm already successful. Uh, and he's like, you know, let's see what happens. So, 2008 happened, and um, it, it's like musical chairs where I just the music stopped and I had no chair. So I went from being worth a lot of money to not like broke, but like owing everybody money, like negative broke. <laughs> and I had all these great buildings that I had designed and you know, they're, you know, people are living in them. And I remember this day sitting on top of the roof of one of these buildings and calling my dad. And I am just crushed, literally don't have any money in, in my checking account, uh, sitting on a building that I, I built. And I call him and I'm like, God, you know, I guess you were kind of right. I, this, this did not work out the way that I wanted. Um, and he, he gave me a lot of advice at, at that time like dads do. One of them was time. I can't, I can't tell you like when it's gonna be, but you gotta like go to bed and wake up the next day and like time will cure all the things that you're kind of going through. I was like, seems like good dad advice, but you know, we'll, we'll kind of see, see what happened. Um, and the other was like, you know, just not, not kind of taking, taking yourself too seriously. So I thought a, a lot about that turned around, uh, drove down to Tallahassee at the time to kind of drink my sorrows away from now just being, being dead broke. 
and uh, sitting around a table with a bunch of, of college students, came up with the idea for uh, the Gotcha Group, for Gotcha Ride. Uh, because the night before, a bunch of students were talking about going out and, uh, you know, they're hitting the bars. And there was a guy like, yeah, you know, a few people drove back with me. And we went back to this fraternity house. And I was like, you know, I graduated seven, eight years before that. Uh, how is drinking and driving like a thing? Like, how have, how have we not solved this, this kind of problem? So getting in the car, driving back to Atlanta that day, I was like, maybe there's a better way to do this. And I had an idea for bringing electric vehicles to a college campus and you know, providing free transportation driven by college students. And that was like the beginning of the idea. A week later, turned back around, went back and met with the, uh, the vice president at FSU and just begged and pleaded for him to give me a chance to bring this idea to life. Uh, I had obviously just come off of a uh, whirlwind uh, career in real estate. So just trying to explain to this, this guy to give me a shot uh, was no easy task, uh, but he did. He, he believed in us and, uh, and allowed us to bring Gotcha to FSU. And there's, uh, there's a cool, if I can do this right. So this is the first day uh, that we brought Gotcha to campus just to show it around. You will notice that the logo was awesome. Um, <laughs> Logo was awesome. I, I, at the time, also thought that like graffiti was really cool, and college students would think graffiti was cool. They, they, did, they did not. Um, but this, this was the first day of Gotcha as a test when we were kind of rolling it out. And again, going back to what my dad said, he's like, look, time. Like, you, you're not going to do it overnight. Time, you're going to start to feel better about yourself. And like my dad is, he, he was dead right, because a few days later, uh, the date was a little off on the first one, but a few days later, uh, this happened. I uh, was in Tallahassee for five days and went out on a, a date with my now wife. So this is the first day in Tallahassee that we went out. We both like Crown Royal, it turns out. And at the, the end of that night, uh, this is us in the fountain at FSU. And, uh, and my dad was exactly right. Time cured it. All of a sudden, not only did I have a new business and an idea of creating something new, but it like changed my whole life. We're married now, have two kids, and, and it, it's been a fantastic journey. But dad was right that time uh, is, is one of the things that it takes to, to build kind of a, a great idea into a business. So Jacqueline and I uh, got the chance over the next five or six years to build Gotcha, literally on the road, meeting with universities and presenting our idea uh, of free point-to-point -point transportation and really trying to build this business together. And we were really obviously excited about doing that. Um, we then, I'll show you this is, I guess, young, young Sean as we, as we brought Gotcha Rides into the world. Um, but if you think about it, this is a time that's pre-Uber. So the idea of free point-to-point -point transportation around a college campus uh, was, I guess, at the time revolutionary. You know, students didn't have a way to get around. Um, and then we had to find a way to make money doing this. So we're like, I bet you a brand would want to give us some money in order to, uh, to, do this, uh, to do this deal. So we did. We were able to convince some brands to fund our project. And they wanted to get in front of the college demographic. So very kind of exciting times. And then in 2016, we had the idea of bringing bike share to life. And again, going back to the idea of, I didn't invent the bike. Um, I didn't invent bike share. There was bike share all over Europe. There were places popping up in the US, like New York and Chicago. Um, but I thought there had to be an opportunity to change the way college students in particular got around to university. And there had to be a cool way to fund that model. So we spent a lot of time, uh, the first two years, designing what we thought was a pretty cool bike uh, that we were very proud that we make right here in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, so instead of building a bike over in China, which is where primarily bikes are built, uh, we're, we're proud that we do that in Charleston, built by, uh, by Charleston residents. So in 2016, we went to our first university partner, Auburn, and delivered these just cutting edge kind of smart bike technology. And it was one of those moments where I had to sit back and think of like, wow, look, look what we did. I had this just career of up, ups and downs. Uh, time had definitely changed my outlook. I uh, was less of a, uh, of, a, of a bad person, I guess, at that point, because I was, I was humbled by the fact that I had, had gone from the top to the bottom and really kind of prioritized my life. But it took me back to thinking that creating something was more valuable than money. And the biggest takeaway I had, the thing that, that revolutionized how I thought about business after having money and losing it, was that's the wrong measurement. 
So I never now think about like how well I'm doing based on how much money I make or how much money is in the bank. It literally is what I want to create and the people I surround myself with every day. I'm fortunate if you haven't gotten a chance to meet everybody with G's on their shirts, but to spend every day working with a pretty amazing team. Um, but I never wake up in the morning thinking about how much money I'm going to make that day because I found that if you put your whole weight of how much cash you have, when it goes away or the day doesn't equal that much money, your value is directly linked to, to that outcome. And trust me, that is an atrocious feeling to feel like you aren't valuable because you didn't make enough money that day. Um, but it was trying to create something that would be valuable and create value for, for other people. So in, uh, in the end of, and our middle of last year, middle of 2016, I had another one of those moments. We had, we had grown to, uh, to a decent size. We were still a small business. And um, we had an investor. We had raised a few million bucks from a, an angel investor and was a good guy. But like a lot of angel investors, like very, very emotional. And I remember on a Friday getting an email from him that said, I'm done. I'm not, I'm not giving the company any more money, even though on paper we were doing really well. Turns out he just had a bad day. He's like, I'm out. I'm not doing anything else. And I remember that Friday afternoon, like sitting there with Jacqueline being like, the hell are we going to do? Like we've grown this company. We've convinced a few people to come work for us. And uh, I said, you know, we're, we're at one of these like defining moments of what could gotcha be, be next. So I picked up the phone, called a guy in Atlanta who I hadn't talked to in a while, who had just always had interest in, in gotcha as a business and said, look, I'm at kind of this, this crossroads now where I think my investor's pulling out and we were literally hand to mouth, you know, on, on checks coming in the mail in order to build the business. And that gentleman made an introduction to a private equity firm in Atlanta. And we were at that moment, where we were able to kind of present our idea. And over the next six months, put a deal together that brought together three companies. Uh, Mindell Ziff, who's in the room, is one of our partners who started Kaleidoscope in Charleston 20 years ago. Uh, and Ryan Leach over here is our, uh, our CFO, was a, a VP at the private equity firm. We all came together and created the new gotcha by rolling all of these entities together. Um, so what that taught me is that that moment where somebody is like, I'm out, I'm cutting and running because they had a bad day is to not let it affect your kind of thoughts on what you want to create and the value of the business you're trying, uh, trying to grow and opportunities come out of that. So this was, let's see, this is the company as it sits today. Literally on November 2016, there were eight of us sitting around that table in an office in Mount Pleasant. That was our entire business. And after we did this deal at the end of the year, we had a team of 40 plus, which blows my mind on a daily basis for somebody who never really had a burning interest to, uh, to have a large team. But overnight, because that person had said, Sean, I'm out, I'm having a bad day and I don't want to be involved in your business anymore, that opportunity allowed us to create what gotcha is today. Um, so I, th I think back on the idea of pioneering and what it takes to go from A to B. Um, I think a lot of times people have the end in mind. I want to grow this great business. I want to have a billion dollar company and be the next kind of unicorn. Um, I would encourage you to not think like that. I would think day to day, know what you love to do. I love to create. I love to be around uh, creative people. Um, but you come up with that. And the idea that you want to show up every day the same way you did the first day you had the idea. And for those of you who know me, I, I look at every morning when I get out of bed as the first day gotcha started. There isn't a, like, this big progression of what it's taken over the years. Every morning is day one. I live with the exact same fear that the business is going to go to zero tomorrow that I did when Jacqueline and I started the company. So to pioneer, to go from your idea to what you consider success, you just have to get up every day, believe in yourself, believe in the people around you, and work really hard. I think the other misconception that people have uh, now is that things just kind of happen. And that's not true. It takes hard work. It takes dedication. It takes failing and failing again and getting up the next day to work forward, work toward your goal. So. I encourage everybody to do the same. I am very thankful that I get the opportunity to do this every day and more excited to see what next year brings because this is not it for us. Uh, I plan on waking up tomorrow and, uh, and growing, growing this business into something that we haven't even, haven't even thought of today.
So thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Love any, any questions. No problem. Yeah, we do. Great question. So the question was, we have, this is our East Coast headquarters. The assumption would be we have another office somewhere. So we do. As, as part of this merger that we went through, uh, we rolled up a West Coast business. Um, so we have an office in LA uh, that actually is in the process of being renovated and will go live in about a week and a half. So yeah, we have a smaller team, probably 15 people or so, that work out of our LA, team, LA office. Ooh, gosh, that, that is a hard one. So obviously b big, uh, so our, w what's my favorite episode of, of The Office? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, oh, that's, there's just so many great, great episodes. Um, pick one. W what's yours? That's great. Fanta fantastic. I actually love it. It's grown anyone where Jan's kind of involved and he can just be a complete goof in front of all those people. But that's, that's a great one. I have to like noodle over it the best. My favorite episode. I, I will. I'll send it out. What was it like uh, starting the bike share program here in Charleston versus another city? And what, what made your choice? Yeah. So has anybody had a chance to ride Holy Spokes in Charleston? Okay. Those of you who haven't, please take us up on the, uh, the free hour of time and, uh, and enjoy, the, uh, enjoy the experience. So uh, because it's our home, it was very important that we got it right. Um, building the bikes here, having a local team, a city like Charleston that obviously cares about the look and feel and historic nature of it made it very unique. Um, but it was work. Like they, I always tell the story that the city of Charleston, uh, city council, the mayor's office, everybody really wanted bike share. And it still took us almost two years. Made me think like, what if they didn't want something? Like how, like <laughs> this, this, this was, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, like a lane over the, over the, the, the Ashley. Um, but it literally was a battle. Um, just to work through all of the moving pieces. But the end result was collaboration between all the parties. So uh, local residents, city council, the mayor's office, local business owners to deploy what I think is one of the best bike share systems in the country because we did go through all of those processes instead of just you know deploying bikes, not kind of having collaboration. Um, at the end, I think we, we met with all the right people and delivered a product that everybody could be proud of. Um, that will be here 10 years from now. And I think that's kind of important to what we do as a, as a business is not just looking at tomorrow or the next day of, of how do you really deploy things that are going to add value over time. So Holy Spokes is, is just that. And Megan, to her credit, has done a, a phenomenal job. So you guys should all call her on her cell phone as many times as possible. Yeah. That's so great, so great to hear. Thank you. Uh, th that is a hundred percent because of the team that makes it happen. You know, we we have a cool bike. It's high quality. There's really great tech on it. The people who are in this room and and the rest out moving bikes around uh, or deploying bikes to our other thirty locations where we have them. It's the people. At the end of the day, I think there are companies out there who it could be an app or or even another bike share system that they just think scaling without quality around it is the way to do it. I, I would bet on people any any day of the week. So so it's great to hear, but it, it's 100% because of our team. Sure. So the question was, are we involved in the overall kind of transportation? Uh, I issue in, in Charleston. So yeah, our, our goal, we are a mobility and advertising company. So half of our business is focused on safely getting people around in a shared environment. So using uh, ride share with our electric gotcha rides and bike share with our, with our bikes. And then the media side of, of finding brands that want to put their logo or their brand on our things is the overall business. So making sure that we help solve the mobility problem uh, is very important to us. And that's, that's not just locally. I mean, Charleston, as we all know, has a, has a traffic problem. And that's hard to say coming from Atlanta for, for 10 or 12 years, but 
we have, we have a traffic problem. Um, I think that my two cents is the way to help move that forward is to share more. So whether that's car share, ride share, nothing drives me more nuts than seeing people drive around in cars all by themselves um, and then parking it for 23 hours a day. So we would like to be a bigger part of that conversation. But our thought is, and I, and I think this is working, that per, by providing bike share and having it work as a mobility option, and if you look at how people are using bike share in Charleston, it proves that this isn't just a way to, for tourists to get around and see the city. It's how people can get from A to B and how they can go to lunch and how they can go see friends and how they can just navigate the city. So we're one piece of a much larger solution, uh, but we hope to be, a, be an active member of that. Yeah, we, we do. So early on, the city went through a pretty aggressive RFP process to you know, make sure that they're fair and balanced to, uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, so five or six different people and companies from around the country submitted a bid. Uh, Charleston Moves has been an unbelievable partner and advocate since the beginning. Um, believed in what we were doing, spent a lot of time learning about the operation so that they made sure not to just endorse a company because they were local. Uh, and we work very, very closely together. So again, our hope is that we provide a solution that a, a group like Charleston Moves and other advocacy groups can then go to leaders of, of the community and share real data in real time about why something works. So they're a great partner. I think they're one of many because it's, it's going to take a, a group effort in order to change the way people think about mobility and, and shared mobility. Uh, but yeah, they've, they've been fantastic. Can you all keep a secret? <laughs> um, so w when we started Gotcha, our original idea was that we wanted to own the space on a college campus that a brand could interact with the, the 18 to 34 demographic. At the time, that was electric vehicles, and that was a time where electric vehicles were still kind of new and, and cutting edge. I think there's, that's still the case, but there's only so long that that's cool and new. Uh, We've always jokingly said that when hoverboards are on a college campus, we just want to own the branding space on a hoverboard and provide ways for, for people to get around. I'm also a big Back to the Future fan, so I'm, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping that that happens. But we're developing things like that, that we can go to a university or a municipality like Charleston, offer a product that is little or no cost, that we found another way to fund so that taxpayers, students aren't having to fund that, uh, that operation. Stay tuned. You should follow us on social media because that's, that's where it'll come. Yeah, great, great question. So hopefully again today you'll, you'll get a chance to ride them, but it all works through a smartphone app or if uh, you don't have a smartphone or you're like me, your, your phone's dead by, by 10 a.m., you can register on a website, you get a code, and then every bike has built in GPS. So one of the reasons we don't take large deposits, it's a big, big problem with, uh, with bike share out there, is that you sign up and all of a sudden, sudden they ding your account for a few hundred dollars while it's on hold, is we believe in the tech and in real time know where the bikes are. So after this meeting, if you took the bike and just wanted to take it to your house, um, we'd be able to knock on your door and be like, we know your bike, our bike's in your living room. So <laughs> <laughs> you should try it. Megan will show up at... <laughs> At your house. Um, but yeah, it's, it's GPS based so that we can see in real time. The theft part of bike share is pretty uncommon. What's really cool about the GPS is that that technology, the tracking of the bikes and the assets for the first time tells us how people use bikes in a city like Charleston. So instead of like hypothetically saying people bike up and down Spring Street occasionally, we can literally show routes to the city of how people travel and who they are. Are they residents? Are they visitors? Depending on what plan they're using, are they going back and forth to work? So now we have real data that the city can say, you know what, we need a bike lane on this street because a thousand people rode back and forth on that street between these hours throughout the day. So the GPS is key. Um, so it could. Technically, you could, through the app, kind of route yourself. And we don't currently do it, but it could send you notifications of things going on in that local market. So that's kind of our hope and evolution for each market is how you interact with your surroundings from the bike. But yeah. 
not yet. Assuming we can like cure this bike lane issue, it'd be great. Our original thought in partnership with the city is how do you take it from 250 bikes to 600 plus? In order to do that, there's a lot of needs still on the peninsula. There's some areas we just don't serve just by nature of the size of the system. But the goal is to expand into Mount Pleasant and into West Ashley. We have a lot of people now who actually bike over the Ravenel, which is amazing. But yeah, happens, happens quite a bit. We've got your bikes. Yeah. I am. <laughs> Give it a whirl. Where do you guys assemble the bikes? Yep. Where do we assemble the bikes was the question. Megan's house. <laughs> um, we, we, have a, we have a warehouse off of Huji Street. Um, and we'd actually like welcome you. If anybody ever, we should actually schedule this one time to, to come see the operation. I, as, as we got busy and, and I had to travel more and more, I didn't get as much time to go spend with our, with our team of bike builders. And I went in there about three weeks ago and it just blew my mind. We like, not only are they unbelievable builders and organized, but we were building bikes for like four or five different universities. One of which is UNC Chapel Hill, which launches, well, launched yesterday. Um, and it's been pretty awesome, but I walked in and we're literally building products from scratch right here in Charleston. So it just, it, it blew my mind that they were, we were able to do it so well. Um, but it's off Hugie street right before Palmetto brewery. So if you're ever in the area, stop on in. Yeah, so I, one is you're gonna be wrong. I think, I think a lot of people have this mis, uh, misconception that the idea you have on day one is the idea and everybody should believe you and you're, you're 100% right. Like, be open to being wrong. Uh, you have to work. There's just no substitute for getting out of bed every day and just working hard. Um, and then just believe in yourself and surround yourself with unbelievably hardworking and smart people. And I guarantee you, you'll, you'll be successful in whatever that is that you, that you want to accomplish. I'm fortunate enough that I get to do that every day. And nobody has any final questions. Thank you, Sean. Thank you.